Having talked about the phases of trials, I want to talk about what is involved in drug discoveries. We talk about new drugs. We clearly need better drugs to treat patients not only with lung cancer but a variety of other cancers. Here you see a cartoon that shows the number of steps involved in developing a drug. Now on the top, on the blue, is basically the discovery process where you're doing all the work in the laboratory setting. You are working with cancer cells. You're trying to find out what's the right target in the cancer cell you can go after. Then once you found the target, you work with chemists to find out what's the structure of a compound that you need in order to knock this target down. And then you screen libraries of drugs to see which of the drugs meets the closest threshold. And then you do some preclinical tests. And if you look at the cost involved in just that, that's close to $700 million per drug. And then you take it to the clinical setting. There's something called an IND or Investigational New Drug Application. You submit information about the drug to the FDA. They review this. They have to be satisfied that this is something that's reasonable and safe to test in patients. And then it goes to the Phase 1, Phase 2, and Phase 3 clinical trials. Once it's completed Phase 3 trials, then it has to be submitted to the FDA for a new drug application, and then the FDA reviews the data and decides whether the drug is worthy of approval. So if you look at all of these steps involved, the entire cost of developing a drug is just staggering. If you see how things have changed over the past 30 years, this curve shows a good example. In 1975, it used to cost $100 million to develop one drug. In 2005, it was $1.3 billion to develop a drug. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is if I have 100 compounds in my lab, the chances are only three to five of them will end up seeing the daylight, in other words, getting FDA approved. So one has to spend $1.3 billion for each of these drugs, and ultimately only three to five will make it for every 100. And this is why developing drugs is an expensive process. Now, we talked about sponsors. So who are some of the common sponsors where you would see the trials coming from? Well, one, of course, is the National Cancer Institute. They sponsor a number of clinical trials, phase ones, phase twos, phase threes. They develop many of these drugs in-house, or they develop partnerships with companies that have promising drugs and then help them develop these drugs. Another big source of development is, of course, the pharmaceutical industry. They develop drugs in-house, and then they work with the scientific community and conduct clinical trials. You'll also see trials being sponsored by cooperative groups. We'll come back to talk about what the cooperative groups are a little later in the presentation. Then there are also trials that are done by specific institutions. For example, my institution might find a specific trial as a promising approach, and they would fund the trial to see this move forward and hopefully benefit patients. So a number of potential sponsors are involved in conducting a trial. So let's talk about a cooperative group. Cooperative groups are entities that are funded by the National Cancer Institute. There used to be about eight or nine adult cooperative groups in the United States. Now it's down to four following strategic mergers required by the National Cancer Institute. Who the groups have are basically physicians and scientists from across academic and community-based institutions. So, for example, the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group has about 15 major academic institutions, including my own institution, Emory, Johns Hopkins, Vanderbilt University, and so forth. And we meet on a regular basis. We work together to develop promising treatment options and conduct clinical trials. And the groups are funded by the National Cancer Institute. You would see that the groups conduct trials varying from Phase 1, Phase 2, to Phase 3, And the adult groups conducting clinical trials in the United States are now ECOG, Akron, which is the group I am part of, SWOG, our Southwest Oncology Group. NRG is a newly formed group that includes the RTOG. They do a lot of radiation-related trials. And then the Alliance, which formerly used to be called the CALGB. So these are some of the major cooperative groups in the country. If you look at the progress made in lung cancer over the past two to three decades, It's safe to say that the cooperative groups have had a major role in improving treatments and developing newer treatments for lung cancer and many other cancers in the country. Let's go through the mechanics of a trial. How is a study conceived? What has to happen? Well, first thing, of course, is to have some promising laboratory findings. So one could see that in the lab setting, a specific treatment or an approach or a drug 
results in significant reduction in the growth of the tumor cells, then you want to bring that to patients. The other is a compelling clinical finding. In other words, like you're following a patient and sometimes there are examples of patients coming and telling us, hey, I took this particular thing and it seemed to work well. The physician observes something that works well for a given patient and he or she wants to find out if that would work for other patients as well. So what you see in the clinic as an anecdotal observation can then go on to be a large clinical trial. The other option is you have success stories in other diseases. You want to see if that drug would work in the disease that you're interested in. So these are all some of the ways by which an idea is developed. Once that happens, you start thinking about what kind of clinical trials are to be done. And when you think about clinical trials, it's important to realize that statistics are a very important part. Because you're trying to find out with the clinical trial how a drug affects the treatment, for the entire patient population. We're talking about treating any patient across the world with a drug, but you don't have the luxury of testing the drug in every patient in the world. You are testing the drug in a limited number of patients. So you're going to extrapolate the information that you get from a limited number of patients to make decisions that will affect the universal patient population. So you have to make sure that you account for differences in age, in gender. In other words, if you did a trial just for men and say we should treat all the women with cancer the same way, that may not be true. A drug may be metabolized differently in men and women and may have different biological effects. So you can't assume that if it works in men, it's going to work in women. So you have to account for differences in ethnicity, the type of disease. And in many instances, you may not know of significant factors that might affect the outcome. So you have to allow for both known and unknown variables. So when you do all of these things, you have to have some science to the way you design a trial and the way you interpret the results. And when we talk about results, the endpoints for clinical trial, what are you trying to measure? You're trying to measure response rate, which is reduction in size of the tumor. What percentage of patients have reduction in size of the tumor? The other thing you can look at in a clinical trial is progression-free survival. You have a patient who is active cancer that's metastasizing and getting worse, and you start them on a new treatment, how long does this new treatment control their disease or prevent it from growing further? That could be months, that could be days, that could be years. So that gives you a sense for how the drug works. The other is overall survival, which we say is the ultimate important endpoint, which is how long can a drug keep a patient alive without the cancer getting worse? And with or without the cancer getting worse, in other words, the cancer may be slowly growing, but if the drug can still control the disease to a certain extent, that would impact the patient's lifespan. You also can look at safety, how safe it is, what are the side effects. Once you decide what exactly you're going to look at, are you going to look at response rate, are you going to look at survival, then the next thing you need to do is to decide how big the trial has to be. And we call that the sample size for a trial. So we already spoke about phase three trials requiring hundreds of patients. You determine the sample size based on the effect size. In other words, if you have two drugs, drug A and drug B, and let's say drug A results in 50% response, 50% of the patients will have tumor reduction, and you want to see if drug B is better than drug A. And if it turns out that drug B has a 90% response rate, you can do the trial with smaller number of patients. But if drug B is only marginally better than drug A, then you're going to need a much higher number of patients in order to prove a smaller difference. The amount of benefit, the incremental benefit, determines how large your sample size should be. If you have a blockbuster drug that works in just about everybody, then you don't need thousands of patients to see this drug works. But if there is a drug with a modest benefit, you're going to have to have a sample size that's adequate. A term that you will come across often is statistical significance. In other words, once the trial results are reported, whether there is a difference between one new treatment versus the standard treatment, the statistics are important. If you say that drug A is better than drug B in a clinical trial, you want to know that that was not by fluke. In other words, if I repeated the same trial 100 times, how often will I get the same results? And since people are different and the diseases are different, it's safe to assume that the results will never be the same every time, but you don't want the results to be dramatically opposite. 
In other words, you don't want a trial in one attempt to say that drug A is better and the second trial to say drug B is better. So if I do the same trial 100 times, I have to get the results that are similar to what I see in at least 95% of my attempts. If they are not, then they are not considered to be of high significance. You want to make sure that the observation is actually of significance. A common way to think about this is these days we're heading for an election and we see opinion polls every day. And often they will use this term, candidate A is ahead of candidate B, but that's within the margin of error. And they'll say the margin of error is 3 to 4%. That's exactly what we're talking about here. Is this within the margin of error or is this outside the margin of error? If a drug is clearly better and it's outside the margin of error, then we say that's statistically significant. That's what we're looking for when you do phase three trials. A term that you might come across in clinical trials is crossover, and I have a cartoon here to explain what a crossover is. Let's say there is cancer X or lung cancer, and you're testing a new treatment, treatment A, to standard therapy. And when you do that, half the patients get standard therapy and half the patients get treatment A, and we're trying to see which is better. But patients with the disease who were randomized to the standard therapy in some trials would be given the option of getting treatment A if standard therapy doesn't work. So we call that crossover. Patients getting treatment A at the outset, but those in the standard therapy, when the standard therapy doesn't work, they can go on to get treatment A later on. So when you allow crossover, then that could affect the survival results of the trial. In other words, if both patients got treatment A, then even if treatment A is very good, you may not see a survival difference because both groups have been exposed to the same treatment. But the progression-free survival would not be affected because you will know that this group did better than this group by the time the disease progressed. This crossover only happens after progression. So there's something you want to ask physicians if you're considering participation in a randomized trial is whether it allows for crossover or not. Some trials do and some trials don't. Now, how do you start a clinical trial? The first thing is to write what is called a study protocol. This is sort of the Bible for that clinical trial. It's the guiding document. Everything is spelled out, and you follow that to the letter. Then you develop a statistical design to determine what are you going to look for, how many patients do we need to participate in this trial. And once this is done, you have to get approval by the FDA in many situations. There are certain exceptions where you don't need an FDA approval, but you get an FDA approval, and then it goes through what is called scientific review by either your institution or by the NCI or the sponsor. And after a scientific review, people say, okay, this is interesting. It scientifically makes sense. It's worthy of further study. Then it goes to what's called an institutional review board. These are bodies that are located in many institutions or also independent of institutions. And they review the protocol to see whether patient rights are protected. Is it safe for patients? And typically, the institutional review boards contain members from population, the community, patient community. They contain experts from different fields, not just medicine. You can have somebody from philosophy, somebody from ethics, and so forth. These are a group of people who look at a study protocol and review to see whether this is safe. The scientific review makes sure it's scientifically sound, but the IRB or the institutional review board makes sure that this does not put patients at undue risk by participating in the clinical trial. Now, once the IRB is reviewed, then you have to develop what we call case report forms on the database. You're collecting information. You have to know what information to collect and where you're going to store it. And once you do that, you have to train all the study staff on the specific procedures for the trial. So the whole process from the time you start writing a protocol to the trial being open to start enrolling patients may vary anywhere from four months to a year and a half depending on how quickly some of these steps are navigated. Thanks for listening. If you like and learn from our Grace Casts, you can subscribe on iTunes by just searching for the term Cancer Grace, find podcasts in the subject you want, pick a format of audio or video, and then just click subscribe. It's that easy. And for those of you who don't want to miss any of our programs, there's even a feed for all subjects. You can also find us on YouTube at Grace for Cancer Info. And that's the number four in one word, Grace for Cancer Info. Finally, if you haven't been there yet, please check out our Grace website at www.cancergrace.org. And don't forget that donate button in the upper right. Our content, which helps tens of thousands of cancer patients around the world every month, is made possible by your support.